We're excited to have Ed Moore back. Ed's been, how long have you been with us now, Ed? I was trying to think, like 2016? Yeah. Well, time flies when you're having fun. It doesn't seem like that long. And Ed's been a fabulous addition to our EIR team because of his expertise and background in medical device. I'm not going to read his bio here or that of his colleagues who are involved in BioFIA. I would love to just turn it over to them and get started, but we do want this to be a conversation. So typically in our EIR workshops, we will actually go around and ask everybody to introduce themselves. We have a large group here today, so I might um, actually bypass that, but please feel free to raise your hand, introduce yourself when you ask a question, and we'd love for this to be an iterative process. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark and Ed to for today's presentation. Thanks so much, Laura. It's a pleasure for us to be here, and thanks for all of you for joining us. Um, and uh, please feel free to ask questions uh, as, you, um, as you have questions going through, and then we'll provide answers. And we'll also have a Q&A at the end of the session. Um, there's three of us here today. Um, I'm Ed Moore. Um, this is Mark Mikus. And on the phone, we have Rich Johnson. Um, Rich, unfortunately, was not feeling well, and so he, rather than making the trip down, is going to provide this part of, part of the presentation remotely. So um, we'll see how this goes. So, um, but uh, I wanted to just start off uh, a little bit. Both, all of us have had uh, a number of years of industrial experience, um, mostly at Baxter and Abbott. Actually, it's all been for us at Baxter and Abbott. Um, but uh, so uh, just as a little bit of a background, but um, so, uh, I wanted to just go into a little bit of, of detail about who we are. BioFIA is a consulting company. We work with small companies, big companies, um, and uh, everything in between to provide them with expertise um, and, and in the areas of all the way from discovery through uh, product uh, approval and then uh, life cycle management afterwards. So um, all of those sorts of elements. And in the areas of both um, Pharmaceuticals, biopharmaceuticals, as well as medical devices um, are the, is the focus for uh, all of our folks. Um, full, and in, in all aspects of R&D product development, as well as regulatory uh, approval of, of products um, is, are the areas that, that we primarily focus uh, on. And there's, uh, we have 24 members uh, currently uh, in BioFIA, so just, I'm not gonna go through and introduce everybody, uh, but. Um, they represent many different areas. They're all subject matter experts having spent their careers um, working in product development or regulatory affairs uh, related to um, any of these medical product areas that I was mentioning um, before. And um, we have uh, a, a lot of different areas of, of expertise and that we can bring to a client. And the nice thing about being a group like this is that if one of us is working on a project for a particular client, um, we can easily call in other members who have other uh, areas of expertise that may be important for that client. So we're all employees of that company. We have confidentiality among ourselves, so we can uh, easily talk to clients um, about different areas that, they, that are important uh, to the client and, and help them out. Um, but with, I don't want to get into a lot of detail about BioFIA. Uh, it's more important that we provide some information for you, and we wanted to talk about medical device product development today. Um, Mark is going to start off, and he's going to touch on these areas of design history files, stage gate reviews, and risk assessment. And then Rich is going to come back and talk about materials and how, how you test those materials in medical devices. Um, and then I'll come back and talk about the regulatory aspects of it. So uh, I want to turn it over to, uh, to Mark. Um, and. Uh, Perfect. Okay. Nothing I like more than giving presentations at lunchtime and there's free lunches. Always get a great turnout. Uh, the downside is if you have a question and you're chewing, it's a little tough to get out. So uh, feel free to raise your hand, finish chewing, and then of course I'll, I'll call on you uh, during the presentation. We have, we have way more material than we can cover in an hour. Uh, I've already complained to Ed about that. We all have too many slides. 
Uh, but it's really more important that you get something out of your investment of this next hour here with us. So please, and the best way to do that is ask a question. If you don't ask it now, please ask it at the end. Now, here's a few questions that I hope every one of you have asked yourselves. And if you haven't, please feel free to do so over the rest of the afternoon as to what is it I'm trying to do as an entrepreneur. You know, I have this great idea. I know it's going to be a great product. And I'm sure every one of you is sitting there going, of course I do. But when it comes to solving problems, and people willing to pay for what your great idea is, is to understand the value to your customer. Not just to you personally because of a great invention you have or a wonderful patent that you just obtained. Um, but the other thing, of course, is where are your customers? Now, just by a show of hands, who believes their customers are only U.S. based? Oh, wonderful. So, so then, who believes your product is going to be used around the world by customers in many markets? Ah, my favorite. I have worked on products like that. And when you think about where they're located, please keep in mind these next questions are critical to your success. Who's going to pay for it? And depending on where you are in the world, it's going to vary. I'll give you an example. If you're in India, as an example, because that's a huge market, a lot of people, there are many products where the patient has to pay out of pocket. So when you're pricing your product, try and remember that, because as you go around the world, different people are going to have to come up with the cash to put on the table. So that's why having value, understanding your customers, where are they located? Other things are, you know, are you going to develop the device yourself? Are you developing the prototype and hopefully some big device company will come in and buy you out? Some of you, I'm sure, are sitting here saying, no, I want to go all the way. Who wants to go all the way? Ah, great soul. Okay, then you're definitely going to want to pay very close attention to some of the slides I have coming up. And of course, where are you going to manufacture the product? Is it going to be here? Is it going to be in one of the countries that you intend to sell it in? Because all of those things make a difference in how you're going to develop your product and where. And you go, wait a minute, I'm right here. Right here in Champaign, Illinois. Well, guess what? Depending on where you ultimately want to sell, long term you may want to reconsider where you're going to finish developing your product or who you're going to develop your product with. And we can talk about that a little bit later, but today the focus is how to develop the product. Any questions so far? Okay. You said I just kept it. Ah, okay. So we talked about where to sell the product, and of course, there, I just mentioned a few of the key areas. Rest assured, and that's going to touch on some regulatory in a little bit. Depending on where you go, the regulatory requirements are different. So how you develop the product could be different if you're only going to sell it in China, and that's it. There's billions of people there, great customers, that's where you want to go, and nowhere else. How you develop it, the regulatory pathway, is going to be different if you're just going to sell it in the U.S. Okay. Now, I'm not going to cover the rest of this because I want to get on to other points of today. Now, that's going to also talk in more depth about the classification of medical devices, which is where we want to focus our energy right now. And so there are three classes of devices. There's a few examples up here. By the way, I am not big on reading words to people, so hopefully you call through the words. Uh, ask questions, stop me at any time. But the basic three classes of devices. I've worked in class two and three. I've never had the opportunity to only work in class one. It tends to be a lot easier. Um, but I was going to talk a lot about that later. Just make a note at the bottom that CFR Part 862 to 892, that section is where you can find a huge list of devices and see how your product can be classified. That will impact how you go forward with what you're doing. But as I said, that's going to cover more of that detail a little bit later. Now, oh, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, maybe this is going to later, but I was thinking. Uh Maybe you're at the point where how do you even know if you have a medical device? Uh, you know, if it's a material that goes with someone else's device or software. 
related to another device, and how does that kind of affect the, the risk of class there as well, or the amount of rates? Okay, okay, so the question is sometimes you're not sure what your next product is going to be. And is it going to be a standalone product? Is it going to be associated with another product? Okay, there's a couple of uh, answers that question. One, of course, is look at that list and see if what you're doing is listed. That's the easy thing to do. Second easy thing to do, wait a little bit to see what Ed has to say. The third thing is, that's at the end of the presentation today, because until I get more details with you, it's not always as straightforward as you think. Um, but you did bring up software, and, and that is an interesting uh, premise uh, to deal with and how to deal with it. And, it isn't even going to be regulated, right? There's some software today that isn't regulated. So it becomes a more and more of an interesting subject to deal with, but it has to get into the depth of what it is you're doing. So we can answer that question. I'll give you a true answer to your question. So I don't think right now I can answer it uh, about getting into the confidentiality agreement and quite some But we'll see if that helps you out. But thanks for the question. Okay. Has anyone ever seen this picture? Okay. If you haven't, memorize it. Okay? Or ask it for a copy of slides it. Um, the reason this is so important, this is a basic fundamental um, waterfall diagram of showing true product development at the highest level. And it's really important. Now, many of you may not even be on this diagram. You may be in what I'll call early stage feasibility work or conceptualization work. Some of you may be beyond that. But if you are, this slide should be lack of memory. And it's really important to understand because regulators around the world are going to be looking for you to provide evidence that you have followed this waterfall set of events right here. Starting with user needs. Basically, who wants to apply and why do you need it? And it's important to really clearly define that. And I've been seeing a number of people that cannot define that well. In the end, you have to prove that your product meets those user needs. That's called validation. Now, in a lot of cases, validation today is done in a clinical environment. You go out, you run a clinical trial. It does not only have to do that, though. A lot of times, people go to the term of human factor study. And you can validate the studies with a summit in the factor study. But in the end, you do have to validate your product before you can sell it. And it's not good for the US. In the meantime, there's some steps along the way, such as tur tur turning your user needs into technical requirements, what the FDA calls, a lot of it is called design inputs. And then, of course, you have to go through the process of making your product. And then at the end, you have to say, okay, can I verify that my product meets what I designed? That's called verification. And as I said, validation is the last step. So if you haven't seen this, please remember it. If you forget everything else I, talk, I talked about this afternoon, this is really important. If you want to take, especially the people that throws their hands at, I'm going to run a company and I want to take my product from where I am today to a global marketplace, you're going to have to go through these steps. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Any questions on this? We'll get into the box in the upper right-hand corner that says reviews, but I want to talk about that in another slide. Okay. Now, the term stage date review. Another term some of you probably have heard of is milestone and funding cycle. And that venture company says, at this milestone, I'll give you another hundred thousand, or another half a million, or another million. Typically, the term safety reviews are a government process, where someone is wants to see how you're progressing, and then allow you to advance. And even in big companies where Ed and I have come from, still, big companies want to say, I want to see how you're progressing before I give you more money to advance your product to the next stage, your development process to the next stage. The FDA and a lot of regulatory uh, environments use the term design review. Now, you may use those terms design review, you know, phase review, in a, in, you know, intermixed, but I want to hear to clearly delineate the difference because 
if you're writing your own product development processes, the documentation of how you do your work every day, you definitely want to have design reviews articulated. You want to execute them through the process, the four at the bottom of the four that the FDA is mandated to do. That means you document the reviews, you have a signature and a data who participated, and you need an independent reviewer. Independent reviewer is someone who's not part of your team, but is technically knowledgeable and it can evaluate the work you've done, whether it's at the design input stage or at the design delegation stage. Any questions about stage and reviews or design reviews? Yes, ma'am. Uh, what's the application for uh, Okay, in a lot of companies, especially in bigger companies, it could be a technical person from some other development team. But they have expertise in the areas that you need expertise in. So, um, if you're developing a diagnostic device, you may find someone else who's developing a diagnostic device, not yours, not on your team, but understand what it, what's involved in diagnostic devices, and that technical person is a very good answer. So, how does the there's nothing It could be. The question I take it in here was, um, how, how does the FDA dig in and find out if you've got something corrupt going on in your development process? And in some cases, they don't. They will not come up. In some cases, what they'll do is when they come in and do an audit of your company or of your product, is they'll start digging through your design history file, which we'll talk about in a minute, and ask questions. The most important thing to understand is there are two types of real FDA acceptance. There is the periodic. They're supposed to show up at every company about every other year. There is for cost. Something has gone wrong with your product, and either you had to initiate a recall, or the FDA received complaints from physicians or patients about your product, and as a result, the FDA shows up in your doorstep unannounced. And they're going to start going through all of your history, your documentation, and ask a lot of questions. And that's where they could find some the corrupt intent, if that's the case. And they have, in many cases. But it's also is possible that people can get afraid of it. Because it's up to you, the company or the developers, to do the right device for the patients or the customers. That's the expectation. Yes, sir. Question in the back. So, it sounds like all those comments were sort of for late stage, very involved things are out of the market. Sort of for the very early stage companies, what should they be doing? I'll get to, if you hold that question, let me see if I can answer that for you. Okay? Great. And this is where I'm going to try and answer your question over the next few slides. It is, there's a term, Trust but verify. Everyone's heard that term before. Well, you may be developing a great product in your lab, but in order, and you may actually bring it through manufacturing to the marketplace. But while you're doing that, at the same time, you need to have a design history file that tells the story of what you've been doing for the past year, two years, five years, however long you've been in the development process. And you tell that story in your design history file. So even once you've started what I call formal development, you will start to develop a design history file. And it can be in two forms. They can be electronic. And a lot of big companies today are using an electronic record retention system to maintain their design history file. But I can tell you in the early days, and even today, it is still okay to have a paper documentation, trace, traceable history of what you've done. And that's what you need to do, even at the early phases. Now, when I say early phases, I'm talking about once you've left feasibility, or early stage exploratory work, and you're actually starting on the development process. And when I say development process, that means you need to have some documented um, 
procedure that you're following in your development process. And if you don't have one, I suggest you start putting one together very quickly. Because when the FDA shows up at your doorstep, here's how it works. Once they get through, I want to tour your facility, I want to understand your organization structure, your show mode, an org chart, etc. They're going to start with, okay, fine. Can I please see your product development procedure? And every company needs to have one, big or small, and they'll sit and review it in front of you, and they'll ask a few questions. And the next thing they're going to ask you for is, okay, can I see your design and development plan? And that is the roadmap of how you develop this particular product. And if you don't have those things, you may, may or may not have, um, you do need to get into the point where you're developing those. That design and development plan will be the start of your design history file. So hopefully that helps answer your question. Okay? Yes, ma'am? In this design history file, is there some kind of, like, not template, but like common procedures or common sections we need to cover? I'll get into that in just a minute. So if you hold that question, we'll see if I can answer your question. If I don't, say, Mark, you didn't answer my question. That comes at the time. Uh, we're running a little bit better. That's what I figured. This is the problem when you get into a pro you know, into an area that you know you're very passionate about. And having spent about 40 years doing R and D on medical products, you kind of get into the you know this is something that's not just a job. This is what you love to do and still love to do even after working for over 40 years in this uh, area. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. So here is what you should have in your design history file. This is the question. Things like starting with what are your user requirements? What are your product requirements? These are, these are terms and other terms you can use. How are you going to verify it? What are your human factor studies look like? If you're in the medical device area and you don't have plans for human factor studies, I suggest you put some in place. And I don't care if it's an app for an iPhone or it's something more complicated than that. We need to have proof that users can effectively and safely use your product. And that's typically done in human factor studies. Validation protocol, risk management protocol, which I doubt if I'm going to get to today, but I don't care about that fast step and get this material. So product records, project records, actually show your de design and development plan. I talked about that a minute ago. Show your verification plan. How are you going to assure yourself and prove to someone else that you've met all of your design input requirements and your design validation plan. How are you going to show the product really does for customers what you intended it to do? Then, of course, when we get to manufacturing, how do you manufacture, how do you show that your manufacturing processes really work day in and day out? Every day that manufacturer is developing, making the product that you spent most of your career trying to develop in the first place. And then an index. Basically, table of contents. How can I find any of these? And there's no set way that you have to do it, but if you have an index, it will make it a lot easier for you when you add new information, as well as when you're trying to talk to someone about uh, requesting information, or when you're updating it. And I'll get to that, uh, updating it you know, in just a minute. Okay, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide because I'm running out of time. But it's important to understand this design history file lives with you forever. Now, true story. In the 90s, I was developed, I developed, I led a team develop a product for Abbott. Uh, that was about 1993. I just finished uh, a year assignment working for Pfizer, who actually had obtained, you know, through all the uh, splits and buyouts, Pfizer actually bought a portion of Abbott that I worked on in the 90s. And when I was hired, I ended up working on the same product that I developed 25 years ago. I didn't know that when I, they hired me, but I think they knew that when they hired me. They said, oh, this guy's back on this, I'm going to hire him for this. Well, 25 years later, one scientist pulls out a document that I signed and said, you know what? This document we're still using today to prove some safety and efficacy, and Rich is going to talk about uh, extractables, leachables, and compatibility. Uh, like, but it's a product, it's a document I couldn't even remember from 25 years ago. It's got my signature still on it. 
Of course, at that time, it's a paper document. They now scanned it in and put it in an electronic file. But that's how long these documents can live with you, forever. And if you develop a great product that medical people around the world want to use, it'll be there for a long time. If doctor likes a product, they don't like to change. I can promise you that. Especially if it's safe, effective, and cost-effective. I'm going to have to move on to risk management, okay? But did I answer all the questions about design history file, your documentation question, please? Okay, important. Risk management, another area that's very important to keep an eye on and make sure you're doing early on in your program. It's basically a systematic approach to how you control the risk that your product brings. Keep in mind, all medical products have some risk. In the end, you'll develop a benefit risk assessment showing why the benefit of using your product outweighs the risk, how in the development process you're going to mitigate risk, whether it's at the design phase, in the manufacturing phase, whatever, I'll talk about that in a minute. But it's really, really important to understand risk management is something you need to be engaged in early in your product development cycle. And once again, it lives with you forever. <coughs> And it will be updated. And how does it get updated? You have to find, everyone heard about products that get recall or complaints, things like that. Um, contamination issues and products get pulled off the market. You've heard of all those things. Well, when you have a medical product on the market, at least annually, you need to review all of your complaints, any issues you have in manufacturing, and decide, is there any new, are there any new risks that your product potentially is going to bring to customers. As a minimum, you have to do it yearly after you've launched your product. And many companies do that. And one of the things you have to do is go back into your risk management files and review them and potentially update them with new information. Because when you have a new product, you're making your best guesses, your best estimates about what you think the situation will be in the real world and people handling your product. But once it's out there, you never know. And Murphy will show up at your doorstep if, if he hasn't already done so. I promise you that. By the way, thanks, Ray. Okay, this is a pretty complicated slide. I'm not going to read all the words, but I want you to at least get a sense for the fact that you have to go through in a, the identification of hazards, how you're going to try and control hazards that could turn into a hazardous situation and ultimately harm a patient what you're going to do to control it, and then how you're going to keep an eye on it, not just in the beginning, but throughout the life of the product. Keep in mind, ISO 14971, if you forget anything else about risk, remember the words ISO 14971. If you want to spend about $150, you can go to the International Standards Organization and buy the document. And I think the 2019 they've just been up, just been issued, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it gets it updated about every three to five years. That's the Bible of how to do risk management. I can't explain it to you in three minutes. No, I'm back three minutes. Uh, but I want you to understand it's really important. And once again, it's something that lives with you forever. And risk management will be part of your design history file and it will be clearly identified in your index. Because people will ask you about it. And when I say people, it could be an FDA auditor. It could be an auditor from China. It could be an Invisio auditor from Brazil. Any one of those orders could show up at your doorstep and start asking you about your products. So keep in mind, the other thing is, how many people think someday whatever I'm developing is going to be bought by Abbott or Pfizer or some other big medical company? Anybody think that could happen someday? Rest assured, and I've been on these visits going to see entrepreneurs, and one of the things they're going to do is say, show me your, tell me about your product, great. Show me, and you're going to show off how well it works. And then they're going to start asking you about your design history file and your documentation and your lab notebooks and who signed your lab notebooks and who's countersigned and maybe reviewed your lab notebooks for the integrity of the data that's in that. All those things are going to be important. They may even start asking about your risk management and what you're thinking about. So these are things that can hit you any time during the development process from early all the way through you're on the market with your own company. Um, I don't really have time to get into fault tree analysis. Um, 
with you. It's basically a top-down approach. Uh, failure modes analysis is a bottom-up approach where you try and, and evaluate and predict how things could go wrong and what you're going to do about it. And there's basically three types of failure modes analysis that people are doing today. There's a what they call a use FMA, or basically, what could a user do wrong? There's design FMA, what could you do wrong in the design of your product? And process FMA is what could go wrong in the factory making your product. And the factory, of course, could be something that's three-dimensional. It could be something virtual like your software. How are you going to make sure you're in control of your software if that's really what your end product is? So these are the three types of FMEA. Uh, the ISO standard explains it in more detail. Um, but I, I just want to say that you see what looks like a fair, you know, this is only one line of a table. And if you go through a really complicated product, this could be an Excel file that has thousands of cells. In fact, I just reviewed one a few weeks ago that I, was, I got a headache after I reviewed it. It was a process FMEA, and it was about 5,000 cells. But as a reviewer of it, I had to sit and review all those cells and make sure I could understand what the person had done and do I agree with everything. So it's a pretty complicated process. It's doable, but it takes time. And it's not fun. Okay, the last thing I'm going to talk about risk management, as I said, it's with you forever. Basically, try and identify, you try and measure, you got to manage, you monitor what goes on with your product, whether it's in the factory or in the field. You may have to report on issues that go wrong, and then you have to take any corrective action uh, as appropriate. I think that was the last slide I have, Ed. So, uh, thank you for your attention. I'll be around afterwards if you have more questions, but I want to at least touch on some of these bases because sometimes when you're in the lab, your focus is. How can I make the prototype better? How can I make it function a little better? It's not quite working right. Uh, but if you forget about all these other things, uh, you could be uh, creating a void for yourself that may be tough to fill months or years down the road from today. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, next, Rich Johnson is going to talk about materials testing. Materials, obviously, a very important element of many of the devices uh, that are used. So, Rich? You're going to, uh, you're going to advance the slides for me? Uh, yes, I'm advancing the slides. I'll advance the slides for you. Okay, sounds great. Um, schematic uh, of a device design process, and I'm going to focus on materials testing and host interaction. So you've taken your device through that device ideation phase, the prototyping phase, and you probably selected materials based on very practical attributes, such as how they're going to be manufactured, you need Rigid, rigid versus flexible uh, types of uh, materials. How are they going to be sterilized? Can you use steam or ETO, which has fallen into uh, some problems lately? But today I'd like to focus on additional considerations of material testing, and particularly how the materials interact with the human body. What are those host material interactions uh, going to do? And especially, how is it going to interact with blood? So the next slide, Ed. So biocompatibility is actually a pretty broad area, but it certainly includes asking how your device material can interact with the proteins that it's going to contact with the elements of blood, such as complement that can induce an inflammatory response, with things such as the coagulation system that can produce emboli, and the cellular elements that it may come in contact with. So you, you don't want these things to produce adverse events. You certainly don't want emboli that can cause a real problem. You don't want to drive inflammatory reactions. So you need to understand these things before you actually enter a clinical development plan. So next slide, Ed. <clears throat> so you're going to do some uh, efficacy and, and safety evaluations. You're going to ask, does the, intended, uh, does the device meet intended uh, medical need? And you're going to go through some of the things that, uh, that Mark just talked about. You can do that with both in vitro lab-based testing or animal-based testing. You're going to ask how the material stability is going to hold up to how you're going to manufacture it, how it's going to be sterilized, uh, and, and ideally, you know, it's going to be shelf life stable. I know with Baxter, they actually had a lab that tested uh, boxes of, of devices that would be bounced on a machine to emulate uh, transport on a truck. So those kind of basic things 
uh, were, were part of the efficacy testing. As far as safety, it's really largely biocompatibility testing. And as I said, that's a pretty broad area, and it's covered by guidelines that are outlined in the ISO 10993 guidelines. And they include such things as cytotoxicity, genotoxicity, and the focus of most of my talk today, hemocompatibility. Next slide, Ed. So this is actually comes from the guidance document on the FDA site that's, that's based on the 10993 guidance. And the real point that I want to make here is that the FDA would like you to provide all that testing on the final device. So the material, it says it, the, the material in this document refers to the final finished medical device product. So you can do testing on materials that are uh, wafers and components, um, but as long as they represent the material as it's, as it's going to be exposed to the body in that final device. So that's a very important component of doing your testing. Next slide, Ed. So as I said, biocompatibility is actually a very broad area and includes things like toxicology, so leachables and extractables. Biophia has a number of uh, experts in this area. Uh, particulate matter, and this includes um, components uh, that uh, shed plastic materials as they're being used. Uh, it also includes things such as protein aggregation that can lead to an immune response. You want to make sure that you don't have any extrinsic microbial contamination, endotoxin, peptidoglycan, or other types of pyrogens that are going to cause a, a response, uh, that your materials aren't going to undergo mechanical stress and, and degrade during use. And then the biological response. What happens when these materials contact blood? You, do you get complement activation? Is it going to induce coagulation and emboli formation? Or are you going to get cellular activation that's going to have some sort of adverse event? And as, this is particularly important for for implanted uh, devices, are you going to generate a foreign body response that's going to compromise its efficacy? Next slide, Ed. So, so here are some general aspects of material testing uh, that come out of the ISO 10994 Part 4, which is the blood material interaction guidance. So are your materials uh, free coatings or do they have a coating? And is that coating stable? Is it going to come off and shed during the process of use? Do you want to test your device in a static versus a flow system? How is it going to be used clinically? You really want to try and do your testing so it mimics the clinical use as closely as possible. What's the surface area that you're going to contact the blood in? So does it represent, again, the clinical use? You don't want to have uh, too small a surface area versus surface to volume ratio in your test system and then find out that when you use this actually in clinical practice that that you've got a much higher uh, surface to volume ratio that's going to lead to an adverse response. What's the anticoagulant that's used, particularly when you've got a blood path in your device? Um, and it, that's um, probably dependent on the type of application. So in the hemo, uh, hemodialysis area, for instance, heparin is routinely used as the anticoagulant. In the apheresis setting, it's, it's citrate. And there are some materials that are, that are frankly used in the apheresis setting using citrate where you don't see much complement activation, for example, but that's only because citrate is a pretty good inhibitor of complement. So you need to know that if that device was ever going to be used in a setting where heparin might be the anticoagulant. Um, a lot of people will try and use dilutions of plasma in their testing, and I would recommend not doing that because nobody ever contacts uh, the human blood in a diluted uh, setting. And dilutions of the components of, of blood that are going to react with that device uh, can lead to a diminished response, which will lead you to an, uh, an error in estimating what your actual response would be. So bottom line here is you want to mimic the clinical parameters as closely as possible in your testing. You can do that either in static test system, and there's a, an example there on the left where you put your material in a test tube, for example, incubate it with plasma or whole blood, incubate it at 37 degrees, stop it with EDTA, and then, and then assay the plasma or the whole blood for the various parameters you're looking at. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Or a dynamic system, we used to set up a lot of these perfusion systems with pumps that would uh, run the blood through uh, the device, a system that allowed us to sample at various points. Uh, and that's a, uh, obviously a, a more relevant type of a system for something like a dialysis or an oxygenated catheter that's exposed to flowing blood. So next slide. Then. Next slide then. 
So I'll go a little bit so into little some, bit of the, some of the compliment here. Um, and I'm not going to go into any other chemistry. This is just a part of the alternative pathway. The thing to the monitor here and the thing to focus on is that C3B is generated in a continuous manner. It's being generated in our in our blood right now as we're sitting there watching these slides. Um, the C3B has a unique thiol ester component that is exposed upon cleavage and covalently attaches to nucleophiles on the surface of biomaterials. Whether that's inherent in the biomaterial or due to protein deposition, it doesn't matter. You get C3B deposition on every material that comes into exposure to blood. The 3A that's also generated excuse me, is a small peptide that is rapidly inactivated and is uh, accumulated in the plasma and it is a very good marker for complement activation. So if you're going to measure complement activation, 3A is definitely a marker you want to measure and there's a variety of commercial kits to be able to do that. The 3B uh, becomes part of an enzyme that leads to more C3B formation, so you get amplification of that initial response. And then on the next slide, Ed. that eventually forms an enzyme which cleaves the fifth component of complement. And so you get two fragments again, similar to the cleavage of C3. The C5A is a potent inflammatory mediator and really the, the, uh, these 3A and 5 are called anaphylatoxins. They can produce an anaphylactic shock. 5A is really the mediator of that response. The 5B that's produced <coughs> forms a complex with a number of other complement proteins that forms what's called the membrane attack complex. And as the name suggests, it actually inserts into plasma membranes and produces a hole, which can cause uh, cytotoxicity. And it's designed to go after bacteria, but it can also cause activation of your cells until they, they bring brought under control by various control elements. A portion of that complex, C5B through 9, interacts with a protein called protein S to form an inactive complex. It's one of the control mechanisms that also accumulates in plasma. So in the 10993 part four guidance, it suggests measuring SC5B through nine to measure the full activation of the pathway. And that's perfectly fine. But people will come and ask me, well, I've got this SC5B through nine amount. What does that mean in terms of an adverse response? And I can't really tell them what that means because there's no biological activity associated with that complex. What I really need to know is how much C5A was generated. So I tell people, if you're doing experiments in whole blood and you can't measure the amount of 5A because it's absorbed by the receptors on all the cells in blood, repeat that experiment in some scale, in a static or not, uh, with plasma and measure the 5A that's generated in plasma. There's a lot of information on how, how much 5A generates a given type of response. So it's a much better marker from my perspective than measuring the actual adverse response potential of that material in contact with blood. Next slide, Ed. So based on what we know about the biochemistry of complement, there's some general uh, things that you can do to try and limit the degree of complement activation. <coughs> As I said, C3B binds to nucleophiles on the surface, and so if you limit the number of hydroxyl or amino groups that are there, you're going to limit the amount of complement deposition that occurs. So the original hemodialysis membranes that were uh, developed back in the 60s and 70s <coughs> um, had cellulose as the material. In order to limit complement activation, they went to uh, cellulose acetate and then cell synthetic membranes that had many, uh, much less nucleophilic uh, components, and so they, that in itself limited complement activation. You can also add charges that limit polymerase formation or bind 5A. You can add, uh, my voice is going here. Uh, hey, Rick, we should probably wrap up here pretty soon anyway. Rich? Yeah, I'm, I'm, my voice is going here, Ed. Okay. Um, let's. Uh, so, so um, just to, these are some of the blood compatibility testing that might be done looking for throm thrombosis, coagulation, platelet function, hematology. 
uh, and immunology. So some different uh, markers all spelled out in the ISO 10993 uh, four, um, that, that describes um, what types of testing needs to be done depending upon the device that you have and how that device interacts um, with, uh, with tissue, human tissue um, that it's interacting with. And uh, just to wrap up, this covers, this covers all the ISO uh, documents that go through all of the different cloud compatibility testing you can do, and, it, and obviously it depends on how your device is going to be used, and so you can see that uh, outlined here, uh, but this is where you need to look for uh, <coughs> guidance on how your, how your device needs to be tested to move forward with the regulatory path. Sorry about that, folks. It's been a tough, tough week for me on this cold. Thanks very much, Rich. That was very good. Thanks. Sorry for the, uh, you know, we're glad that you could help participate in this, uh, this presentation in any way. So thank you. Um, I wanted to wrap up, and I know we've got a few minutes left here, but just a uh, uh, few um, to, with uh, regulatory aspects of medical devices. So medical devices are regulated different than pharmaceuticals and biopharmaceuticals. Um, uh, this is, um, and there are, there we go, uh, two different um, you know, approaches that are taken. But the, the FDA um, is, has a set of approaches, and these are all um, it, it described under the CDRH um, section of the FDA, and you can go to the website and you can see um, what, the, what the FDA requirements are, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. And the, the EMA, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And again, here's a, a reference to the website where you can find um, information for, for on the, the European uh, approval uh, process. So different processes are used uh, around the world. As, as Mark had said earlier, though, that in the US, um, the US FDA uses different classifications of devices. Class one devices are very simple devices, band-aids, um, tongue depressors, gloves, all of those are regulated by the FDA, um, but, not, uh, but they need to be registered. There is an approval process that is used um, for those simple types of, of devices. And the FDA describes examples of what would be considered class one um, device or what would be class two devices, a little bit more complex, but these are devices that the FDA has already reviewed and regulated and has examples uh, of class two devices. Um, they're, um, they are still simple, um, generally simple devices, but again, the FDA already has examples of where they have regulated these devices. And so it's a matter of showing your new device is showing equivalence to a previously approved uh, product. You have a question? Um, so aside from the complexity, my understanding um, from previous re research is that um, if the device is inserted in, inside your body, it's classified as uh, like a class three, like mandatorily. Is that true? Because um, if it's inside your body, you have to overgo some testing that like tissue should be surrounded around the medical device. Right. Is so um, I should have, and in the, for the FDA or for the EMA, it's all about, so the question is um, if it's going to be inserted into your a body, so it's in, in uh, contact with tissue, would it be considered a, a class three device? Um, and, and so the answer is really, it's all about safety and efficacy. And so um, the, the FDA and, co and the company will evaluate with safety and efficacy. But you can have a catheter, for instance, as a class two device, and it it's can be inserted into the, in the body um, if it's, you know, and again, it depends upon if, if it can be demonstrated to be equivalent to a previously approved um, device, then it's considered a class two. Um, and, and, and so there's always questions. I think Stephen asked a question earlier about, um, you know, uh, if it has software, it has, you know, there's a, the best way to find out is to talk to the FDA. So they're always very open to discuss with, especially startup companies and small companies, 
Um, so if you have a question, you say, hey, I've got this device. I think it's a class two. What do you think? You know, um, you would go to the FDA as a proposal to say, this, we propose that this, we're going to describe our device to the FDA, and we propose that this device is a class two device. Do you agree? You always go to the FDA with a proposal. They don't, if you go to them and say, well, well what do you think? Well, the, I've had this happen to me. I'll come back with the answer of, we're not your consultants. Go back, figure it out, and come back to us with a proposal. Um, because then they can take that proposal and they can evaluate it against other internal documents that they have that are often proprietary, or, and they will kind of consult a number of their internal reviewers with the proposal. So if there's a question about, um, I think this is a class two device, um, and obviously there's an advantage for you thinking it's wanting it to be a class two, it's a much simpler process, easier process for approval. Now, just because it's a class two device doesn't mean that you won't have to test it uh, for all of the ISO 10993 biocompatibility tests. That will still be required because you still need to demonstrate safety and efficacy. So it doesn't completely exonerate you from doing all the testing. It just means that you don't have to show um, that you go through a, a very complex clinical trial and a, and a complex approval process with the, and we'll talk about in a second, the pre-market approval uh, in order to demonstrate um, the safety and efficacy of, of the product. Um, hey, there's a question in the back. Yeah, okay, sorry. So for, sorry, for class one, it was the leading five thing here also, uh, and also if uh, the material has been used in uh, the same similar applications, would we need to do the body uh, compatibility again? So class one devices only need to be registered. They don't have to go so through all the 510K so approval. Yes. If, if the FDA agrees that this is a class one, that yours is a class one device, then all it needs is to be registered with the FDA. And, and it means that the FDA may come in and they may audit. Um, and, but, uh, so they know that the device is out there. They know that you are the manufacturer of this particular device. And at some point, they may come in and audit, especially if there are problems that have, have come up. And you'll need to have all of your documentation in place. And you may have to do biocompatibility testing, depending upon what the device is, and show that it's safe and, and efficacious. But if it's a class one device, it only needs to be registered. So how do you know if it's a class two device or not? Well, there, FDA has a database of all of the 510K approved products that they, that they have from all the class two devices. And so you simply need to go to this, um, the, this website and, uh, and query this uh, website to see if you can find comparable products. And so, um, if for instance you were developing a new glucose monitor and you said, and, and maybe it's a point of care device or maybe it's something that's unique and novel and different, it's not just a, it's the same old, same old uh, glucose monitor, but, but anyway, it is a glucose monitor and you want, you want to say this device is equivalent to glucose monitors that are on the market. You can go look and see, here's one that was made by Bayer, it's Contour, let's take that as an example. Oops, and I can go, um, and I can go to the, uh, this FDA website and I can look for where's the Bayer Contour um, uh, Next monitor, glucose monitor, and you can find out all the information there is about it. You can say, okay, fine, we can show uh, equivalence to that. Um, and as I say, there's detailed information that's listed about the approved devices the FDA has that are class two devices, and you can show, uh, show hey, I'm equivalent because of X, Y, Z, and then, um, then you can uh, then apply for a 510K uh, approval, which is a pre-market submission that simply shows here's the device, here's the safety, here's the efficacy data for the, for the device, Here's how the, the clinical data that shows equivalence to the previously approved um, device that's a class two device, therefore we think you ought to approve this. The FDA takes your approval and 90 days later they have to tell you yes or no, we agree that it is. They may say we have questions, so they may stop the clock, send you some questions, and you have to answer those questions about the file, but if, as long as you get back to them in the prescribed amount of time, then they have to still stay within that 90-day window. If you go beyond their 
reply dates, then all of a sudden you're into a whole new 90 day window. Um, so, but it's a very quick, simple process for approval. Um, and so, then there's class three devices, which are required pre-market approval. There are much more complex devices. There's no existing device out there like it that you can show equivalence to. And so therefore you have to go through the pre-market approval process. And that involves going through a fairly extensive characterization of the safety and efficacy um, of, the, of the device, submitting the pre-market approval, doing a, a submitting for an IDE for a, a clinical data, so an investigational device um, exemption, so it means that you put together a protocol for how you're going to test this clinically, the patients that are going to be involved, um, all the patients will go through the, their local IRBs and will be approved, but it's much more extensive in terms of how you collect the data and then how you demonstrate to the FDA that um, this device is, uh, is safe and efficacious. So it's a much more extensive process for going through, much more expensive process to go through, and um, it's why people try to, to show that they have, cla have uh, class two devices, not class three. But sometimes you can't, there's no, um, there's no escaping the fact that it is a, a, a class three device. The Europeans have a different process. Um, it used to be that it was only, devices were only CE marked, which basically mean, meant that they meet all the electrical standards. And so a very simple and not regulated process. But the Europeans decided that no, they need to have a little bit more control of the devices that are sold in Europe. And so in 2017, they passed this, uh, this um, approval process um, that requires uh, going through and demonstrating the, the safety and efficacy of, um, their, of a device that's going to be sold in Europe. And this takes full effect in 2020, in May, coming up, May 26. So any new devices that are being uh, entered into the market need to meet that. And all devices by 2022 need to uh, be compliant with the uh, European uh, directive. That's, uh, and it's outlined in, this, uh, in the uh, websites that uh, are listed, listed here. So um, I know we're running on short on time. But, so you might say, well, how do I know what all these things are that I need to do? Well, the, whether it's in Europe or whether it's in the U.S., there are guidance documents that you can, um, you can uh, look to. And the guidance documents um, describe many of the aspects of how to get uh, a device developed and how to get a device, device approved. There are also voluntary standards that provide um, good background information as well, either from the American Society of Testing and Materials, the ASTM, or the um, American Advancement of Medical Instrumentation is another good source. But um, the, another one is, is the ISO um, documents, and both Mark and, uh, and uh, Rich had referred to the ISO um, documents that are out there. There are many, many, many ISO documents, but there's 101 um, that apply to medical devices. And uh, probably one, you've heard of two of them already, 1093, and we've talked about one as well, but the 1345 is a document that you absolutely also must look at if you have a medical um, device, because this is the quality management system that the, the regulatory authorities will expect you to um, follow. And so it's a good idea that you go and consult um, ISO 1345 and make sure that what you're doing is compliant in terms of your quality management system with the device that you are developing and that you're going to be manufacturing. And developing quality systems starts with day one. It's documentation, it's all the, all the, the, the uh, documents that you're compiling to support um, the design and development as well as the documents for ultimately for manufacturing um, these devices. So understanding these ISO documents is, is very important for your development process. And so um, that's, that's basically all we wanted to cover today. I know that was a lot and we went over a little bit on time. Um, sorry about that. But um, I think one, one other thing that I wanted to make sure I mentioned is that some, sometimes you're working with combo um, devices. 
and Steve, maybe that was also part of your question earlier, because devices, uh, they, they can be either com combinations of two different medical devices, it can be a combination of drug and device, or it can be a combination of drug and drug. And the regulatory authorities accommodate those combo devices, and they're becoming more and more common. We put a drug into a pre-filled syringe, that's a combo device. We put a, a drug onto a stint that we're going to insert into um, for uh, whatever, for vascular or for any other purposes, that's a combo device. So um, understanding, and, and the, uh, there is an office in the FDA, an office of combination products that looks at these combo devices and says, oh, this is a combination of, of drug and, um, and, and a device. So we have to get both the um, maybe CDR and CDRH reviewers involved in this whole process, and one of them will be designated as the lead reviewer, lead review uh, agency. And so, um, but, but it's all regulated through, it's all, all that's taken care of within the, within the agency. So um, uh, that's another very important element of what's going on today in the, in the industry is development of combo devices. So anyway, um, what other questions do you have that we can help answer? There was a question that I'm not sure we answered, so I'd like to try and see if I can maybe give, and that was a question about biocompatibility and if I'm using the same material that someone else has used, do I have to repeat the testing? And the answer is absolutely. Not go, why would I say that? Two things. One is, in your design history file for your product, if you don't have the report showing you've done it, that's going to be a red flag. And then I say, yeah, but Joe across the way in product X, he's using the same material. Now, let's talk about that. It looks like the same material. They say it's uh, yeah. some version of polypropylene, and that's what you're using. Now, my question to you next is, how are they sterilizing it? On the package, you said sterile product. And you said sterile product. How are they sterilizing it? Well, maybe they're using ETO. And you say, wait a minute, ETO's getting a lot of bad press right now, especially in Illinois, and you're going to use EB. Well, guess what? As Rich said earlier, the sterilization process is going to impact those materials in different ways and not necessarily get the same results in that biocompatible. So I just want you to make sure that you're very thoughtful about what you do and assume you don't have to do. Now, if it's your own product and you've done the testing and now you're doing a product line extension using the same materials, processed the same way, you've already got it in a file, you can reference it because it's yours and it's your data that you want. So just keep that in mind. Hopefully that more maybe answers the question I think you were asking. I hope it does. The other question, point I want to make is, just so you know, both Ed and Rich are PhDs, and I'm an engineer, not a PhD. And so when Ed shows you a slide on a class two device, and you see up there an infusion pump, he goes, those are easy to do. I've developed multiple infusion devices, they are not easy to do. So anyone that's developing one, please ignore what Ed just said, okay? The other nice thing is that when you have PhDs like Rich, and they do what I call cartoon chemistry, trying to explain, you know, to non-chemists, the, the cascade of events that goes on and uses their, uh, I call it their little pictorials to try and teach us how to do it. Those are really nice things to have, especially if you're trying to teach other people in your group, in your department, in your team, or something else. That kind of work is really nice to have, and having people like that and a diverse team is really uh, helpful uh, in many cases. So I want to thank you all. I don't try to differentiate scientists and engineers. But I. Okay. I'm an adorable. Any other questions that you have? Well, thanks very much. Uh, I'm down, most of many of you know, I'm down here on campus uh, once or twice a month. And uh, always available by phone. I have Rich, uh, others from Biofia also available if we can help you with any of the uh, problems that you have. Please be sure to let us know, and we're more than happy to help out. Thank you.